keep us, to lead us, to guide us, to comfort us until you come again. We look forward to that day and we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you, Lord. You never leave us alone. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You are always with us. And because of that, Lord, we can gladly say you are welcome here. You're welcome here and you're welcome here. And Lord, may what you do here and here, may we bring that out there. We pray for our community that because of the presence of you we carry within, that we could impact and bring people into the kingdom of God. And we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you in advance for what you're doing here in the Walker area and abroad. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Amen. For those of you who have just tuned in online, I just want to say welcome. I'm Pastor Marcy, and uh, we're glad to have you either for the first time or, or once again, we say thank you uh, for joining us. So today I want to talk about illuminating salt. Have you ever thought about how salt can illuminate? Or having an illumination that actually seasons things, seasons people, brings out the best. I'd like to share with you a story about our friend Roger. You know, we went to his memorial service last week that I spoke about briefly. And uh, Roger had such an incredible faith walk. He fully illuminated Christ in all of the things he did. Everything was about Christ. And he was salty. Oh my goodness, was he salty. <laughs> Sometimes we use salty in that term like, ooh, that's good, but I'm not sure why. You know, he was salty. Uh, oftentimes when we go to a memorial service, we think, as they're memorializing or eulogizing the person, we think, who are they talking about? You know, because they overstate. Like, this person that was just sort of man is now a hero. They overstate. Well, I'll tell you, at his memorial service, I think they understated the guy. And because he just was so real in his faith and in his relationships with people. You know, we met him first at the church we had been attending. You see, the senior pastor had asked Rick and two other guys to join him in an accountability study type group. And Roger was a part of this group. His wife, Anne, was a beautiful, is a beautiful musician. Um, she's a pianist. Uh, wow, just an amazing pianist. She um, worked at North Central College and uh, did the, all the music for their programs, their tours, their everything, you name it. And so when um, the music professor at North Central would come and, and sing, she would accompany him. And so we got to know them that way. Rick and I had vacationed with Roger and his wife Anne in Mexico several times. We had many encounters with people, um, cab drivers, hotel receptionists, you name it, housekeepers, people on the street. And he would just talk to them. Even if he couldn't speak their language, he would just talk to them about Jesus. You know, you really only have to learn a few words. Jesus te amo. Jesus loves you. That's amazing, isn't it? And if you live that life before people and they really understand, that changes things. He also made a dent in his neighborhood. He and Anne would um, sit out on their front driveway. They lived in the cities, obviously. And they had one of those portable fire pits. So every night, they'd put their fire pit out there and light it up, and they'd put chairs around it. And whoever walked by, they would invite to sit with them. They'd talk about life. How are things going? How's your job? And he would just do ministry out of normal life situations. He just loved people. You know, he never took himself seriously. We were praying about this this morning. You know, sometimes we take ourselves so seriously. So much so that it makes us sick inside. 
He never took himself seriously, but he always took his faith in Christ, the commission to go. He always took that seriously. You know, but he also loved a good laugh. And so one of our friends was sharing with Rick uh, at the memorial service. She said, you know, Roger was so good about starting conversations. He would come and he'd say, how are you? She'd say, good. How's your marriage? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> how are your finances? Well, they're great. You know, we took that financial peace course. He'd say, well, how's your weight? Well, she'd take and slug him in the arm and they'd have a good laugh, you know? No woman wants to talk about her weight. <laughs> Especially as you're, you know, greeting middle age. No woman wants to talk about her age. So he just loved to laugh. He knew the key to getting into people's hearts was to disarm them with laughter. And then they could talk about the real stuff of life, right? So Roger had cancer four times over his lifespan. And uh, this last time, he, he, along with his wife, decided they weren't going to take treatment for it. That he was going to, because really, all it would have done, possibly, is ex you know extend his life a few months. And so he decided, I'm going to live my last days to the fullness of the glory of God and not be under medication. Mm -hmm. That makes it so I can't think. That makes it so I can't relate. He was a true disciple of Jesus Christ, living out the Beatitudes to the best of his ability. Remember last week we talked about the Beatitudes, about how it really is the embodiment of Christ. He wanted to impact the world even up to his last breath. And people he had ministered to, there, was, there were always people at the house. Just speaking into him, saying, this is what you did for me. This is what you showed me out of your life. So he would get cards, he would get phone calls, he would get people stopping to visit. He permeated and penetrated the people he touched with the illuminating, salty faith of Jesus Christ. He was always poised for action. He was always ready. Because see, a true disciple is always ready to move at the beck and call of Christ. At a moment's notice, with no hesitation. And relationship with other people has to flow out of that pure and undefiled faith in Christ. That understanding of the go has to be the fuel that gets you moving. True faith. A deep relationship with Christ produces disciples who not only live out the reality of being salt and light to the world, but they actually don't even have to say anything. Mm -hmm. They just are salt and light. They understand. They're salt and light. And everything they do seasons and illuminates. Mm -hmm. Jesus, he, in Matthew 5, continues to teach discipleship principles. We know at this point probably most of it went to the head because they're still in their, you know, infancy of following Christ, right? And so much, so often in our infancy, we try and understand it all in our head. Um, it takes a while for it to just sink. Last week we talked about how Jesus is the embodiment of the Beatitudes. The blessedness that comes into your life is only by him and through him. Mm -hmm. Every blessing flows from the throne of God. This is well and good to understand in our, and apply in our own lives. But we also need to have our relationships melded by the attributes we find here. The ability to walk with Christ should make a change in our life. We should be able to have relationships with people who are theologically, religiously, politically, culturally different than us. Yeah. We shouldn't all be the same because it's not a picture of heaven. Right. And we can't allow our culture and our society to define and divide us based on those criteria. If we are going to be in heaven as one body, we better start reflecting it here in the church, right? And our church should reflect 
the people that we have in our culture. That's what our body should look like. Jesus, and he doesn't care your gender. He doesn't care your political, because Jesus isn't a politician. He doesn't care about your theology because he'll straighten it out if you search and seek him. He doesn't care. Those things are not problems for him. But we make them problems for us. So in this, Jesus uses pictures that are culturally familiar. He uses objects that are culturally familiar and religiously familiar so that they can apply them to their lifestyle. And he uses a broad content, the world, because we first have to think on the abstract, on the big picture, before we ever allow it to sink in there. Mm-hmm. We're so busy self-protecting our heart. Mm-hmm. And so, like Roger, with his humor, Jesus uses the world. He paints a broad brush, mm-hmm. and eventually it gets down into here. So let's turn to Matthew 5. I'm going to read 13 through 20. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, Not one smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it's all accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. As a disciple, you are the salt of the earth. He says that right there. You are the salt of the earth. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and you want to follow him the rest of your days, you are a disciple. Whatever stage you are in, you are a disciple. Therefore, you are the salt of the earth. Salt is mentioned over 40 times in the Old Testament. And the first mention of it is in in Sodom and Gomorrah. When Lot's wife looked back and she was turned to a pillar of the salt. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah were judged for their debauchery and for their neglect of the poor. Now, so often there's words in scripture that we don't understand. So who can tell me what debauchery is? Exactly. Exactly my point. Let me tell you what it is according to Miriam Webster, who's really good at defining words. He even wrote a book about it. (laughs) Debauchery is an extreme indulgence in bodily pleasures, especially sexually. It includes all behaviors of self-indulgence, sex, drugs, alcohol, materialism, food, That's debauchery. But it's primarily any type of sexual thing that goes outside of God's moral standard. Okay? We look back to Genesis, we know God's moral standard. So we don't have to go any further, right? That's what debauchery is. But here's the thing. They were also judged for neglecting the poor. Have you ever thought about that? You see, we're so focused on one specific issue that we forget there's so many more issues that surround it. We get so focused. 
Well, you know, salt is a very stable compound. It will always be sodium chloride. It's naturally occurring and it's pure. And the only way it can lose its saltiness is when it's contaminated, mixed with impurities, or if it's oversaturated, maybe with water, maybe with broth, something like that. I remember once when we were in India, I was sitting down at a restaurant, and uh, in our hotel we had a, a restaurant, and I love curry. And it's one, I, I love food from all over the nations. I, it's probably one of the things I miss the most, because you know we don't have so much variety up here. If you want a good burger, you can get a good burger up here, right? So, but I love curry. So I take a bite of this curry, and I realize it needed salt. You know, salt brings out the flavor. It needed salt, so I <coughs> couldn't get salt out of the shaker, much like Africa with the humidity. Couldn't get salt out of the shaker. They didn't put rice kernels in with the salt. So I opened the top, and I pour a little in my hand and sprinkle my food, and then, you know, even when you do that, you still have some left in your hand, especially when you're human, so I just kind of went, when no one was looking, right? And, uh, it had no taste. It just wanted to go. <laughs> it was so terrible. It had no taste. I can't even explain to you how disgusting that is if you've never tasted saltless salt. <laughs> I just can't even explain. It's like eating a saltine with no salt on it. Or with only worse. It's just terrible. It was, it was disgusting. So salt in the Bible is used as a symbol of witness, as in Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. Salt was used for preservation. You know, they didn't have refrigeration, and so they would salt their meat. It was used for disinfecting. It was used for seasoning. It was used as a part of a covenantal offering to the Lord. It was used as a unit of exchange, and it was used as a symbol of friendship. It was a valuable commodity to the ancient world. To the Romans, it was a measurement of a soldier's wage. And so now you know where you get that phrase, he was worth his salt. Okay? He's a worker worth his salt. Comes straight out of the Romans' understanding of the value of salt. To the Greeks, it was divine. And to the Arabs, it was a symbol of promise or friendship as they made a, a promise to one another and then they would throw salt over their shoulder. It was a very valuable commodity. And it's within these contexts that Jesus is teaching about what it means to be a disciple. In our passage, we can easily discern that Jesus is speaking about salty as in seasoning. Because he says, if the salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? You can't. You just throw it out. Even Job understands we need salt when he says, can something tasteless be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Jesus is exhorting his disciples to be a distinct flavor to the world. You have to be a distinct flavor to those around you. The world will either love the flavor or hate the flavor. That's not your problem. You be a distinct flavor. Diluted salt in the church comes as we allow a watering down of the faith. In Luke 14.34, different passage. I don't even think I've given this to you, Heidi, uh, because it's a different version. It says, salt is good for seasoning, but if salt were to lose its flavor, how could it ever be restored? That's a little sobering, isn't it? It will never be useful again, not even fit for the soil or for the manure pile. If you have ears opened by the Spirit, then hear the meaning of what I've just said for yourselves. I remember when my mother-in-law would have surprise guests. If she was ser serving soup, she could always add more water, right? Always add more water, more broth. She was amazing at stretching a meal, as most women were of that time. So, but one thing she would always do 
is she would always add more salt when she added more water so that she could enhance the flavor of the meat, so that she could enhance the flavor of the vegetables. She was a great cook. And no one really understood how she could do that and how she would season things with just a little extra salt. You know, we have some of her recipes and they just don't taste the same because she would just add a little extra salt here, a little pinch of that there, and she never wrote it down. This is exactly what she did in her faith. You know, she wasn't perfect. But she spoke and lived according to scripture and she salted the people around her. And when she was empty, she went and filled up through prayer, praise, and worship. She read the scripture. Jesus wasn't commanding his disciples to be salt. He was saying, you already are. Because you have me in you, you are the salt of the earth. You know, if a person says they're a Christian, there should be a distinct flavor to their life that impacts those around them. As a disciple, you are a light of the world. The light of the world. Not a light. The light of the world. Verse 14 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and pass it under a basket, or put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light. And just as Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. And why? We must receive him. See, there's only one way to the Father. His name's Jesus. There's only one way to guarantee eternity in heaven. His name is Jesus. And this is good news. Yeah. This is really good news. Yeah. It's the only faith in which you're guaranteed a ticket to heaven. And it's through Jesus Christ. And it's through following him and it's through living by him, like him. It's good news. We can't hide that message. We can't hide our light. We can't dilute that message and, and water down the gospel. There's only one way. One way. Light illuminates. Light sanitizes. Light kills fungal growth. Light feeds the plant life and it causes new growth. So light feeds and causes new growth. Light is meant to be visible. That's why we turn the light on, so that we can see, right? Light is meant to be visible. I remember one time when we were camping. Our family always turned in earlier. Our children would always be so mad at us. Because we go to bed early. We were early to bed, early to rise. And they couldn't figure out why they couldn't stay up with the, their cousins. And they couldn't figure out the next morning why their cousins could never get out of bed. So they missed the best part of the day. Well, when we would do this family camping, we would take turns cooking. And whoever cooked the evening meal, um, the other, someone else would clean. And you'd have to put everything away in bins, and you'd have to make sure no food was left out. Sometimes we camped in places where there were bears. And so you wanted to make sure you weren't leaving any traps out there, any, you know, temptations. So we would have to put everything away. Well, this one night, we're sleeping in our tent, and, and the moon is shining, and, and we hear this. Rick heard it first. He hears this. What is that? And then we see these little shadows dancing in front of our tent. He's like, what is going on out there? So he quietly unzips the tent. And he peers out there, and we've got these little raccoons who are trying to carry off our little food thing. But it was so heavy they couldn't get very far. You see, the light illuminated them. The light showed us what was going on. So he throws something near them, not at them, he throws something near them, and they kind of went, Psh. they scattered. The next day we were able to laugh about it as we shared with the others, and, and again they were reminded they can't leave things out. 
The light illuminated the deeds of the raccoon. They were not happy about it. Some will not be happy about the way your life illuminates their deeds. They may even strike out at you. Others will be relieved to know that there is a way out of evil and out of the bondages that have held them captive. Illumination is meant to bring about change, repentance, but not everyone needs this opportunity. We still have to be light. We still have to be visible. The light must shine where the people who need it most can see it. We can't hide away in a closet. We can't put on a disguise to avoid people. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you're a scholar. A scholar. It doesn't matter if you've gone to Bible school. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian 50 years. It doesn't matter if you're 10 and it doesn't matter if you're 80. This is being a disciple. Is You are a light. You are the light of Jesus Christ. We are the light of the world. <laughs> Seclusion, keeping yourself away from people, is for a dead religion. I don't want to live a dead religion. I want to be alive in Christ, right? Yeah. I want our church to be alive in Christ. I want us to actually do something that's meaningful, that brings people into the kingdom of God. John 9, 5 says this. While I'm in the world, this is Jesus speaking, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, is Jesus living within you? Is he still the light of the world? Through you, right? Nothing changes that. Light must permeate and penetrate the darkness. It must create an uh, atmosphere of welcome. We need to be welcoming. In ancient times, hospitality was of utmost importance. In Israel, the traveler was protected by law. Did you know that? They were protected by law. So when they needed a place to stay, they were promised food, shelter, and good treatment. And this custom is carried on today. Jesus is the most hospitable of all. And as he shone his light while he walked this earth, that's what he's asking us to do. So I want you to be out there. I want you to shine your light. So how is the light made visible? We have it right here, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. James tells us that faith without works is dead. He also tells us that pure and undefiled religion is to care for the widows and orphans. And in Isaiah, he tells us, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight, cease to do evil and learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. That's what it means to walk as a person of light and show works that really make a difference. God is described in Psalm 146 this way. He executes justice for the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. He sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. He raises those who are bowed down. He loves the righteous and he protects the strangers. And he supports the fatherless and the widow. Douglas O'Donnell defines good works as actions that have commanded us actions that God has commanded us to do in his holy word. That's a good word. What is God commanding us to do? Well, you just talked about how God is described. He says, faith is a stimulus for truly good or God-pleasing works. And good works are only good if they're actions taught by God in his word. Mm -hmm. So when we help the helpless, when we love the unlovable, when we feed the hungry, when we clothe the naked and just serve people in general, all in the name of Jesus Christ and by his spirit, those are good works. So when we sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Is he? Yeah. yeah. 
Can he disrupt our life and say, hey, I want you to stop by the road and do this. I want you to reach out and do that. Someone's having trouble. I want you to help them. See, there's a definite connection between ethics and evangelism. If you are the royal priesthood, if you are salt and light, we follow God and we do good deeds to help those because that's what God does. Too often we say to people, why don't you come to church with me? Which we should. Well, why don't you come to church with me thinking at church they'll find Christ. And they might. But you know, most people find Christ out of relationship with you first, and then out of that relationship are drawn into the family, the church. So we can't use that, come to church with me, if we think that that's how they're going to know Christ. We need to illuminate Christ to them first and foremost. Okay, does that make sense? I'll tell you, if you live like this, as illuminated salt, you're guaranteed a reaction. People will either be drawn to salvation or the result will be persecution for you. You might be rejected. You probably won't be beaten. But those other forms are a form of persecution. Let's go to Matthew 5.17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Whoever then annuls the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the why of persecution. Teaching the stark reality that Jesus is Messiah. The fulfillment of God's word. Carrying out everything written and teaching others to do likewise will bring the same persecution that he faced. He's the only way to heaven, according to scriptures. We can never water that down. We can never dilute that. We can never mix something in with that. That's the stark reality. And it will cause a reaction. Persecution is a reality of the first century church. You can read about it in probably every New Testament book. It is a reality. But Jesus says, I chose you out of the world. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Again, may not look the same here, but it could happen. Here's what I want to tell you. Keep illuminating. Keep illuminating. Keep lifting up Jesus Christ. You see, if the name of Jesus Christ, if Jesus Christ himself as Savior of the world is lifted up, he will draw people to himself. Keep sprinkling salt. Keep sprinkling salt. Jesus tells the disciples in the face of persecution, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven. So as the worship team comes forward, I just want to bring this to a close. Even in the face of possible persecution, we must remember what Jesus said. Luke 9, 62. In a paraphrase, says this. This is Jesus. He's responding to his disciples. Why do you keep looking backward at your past and have second thoughts about following me? When you turn your back, you are useless in God's kingdom realm. Just like Bob's wife looked back. She looked back on that place so very far away from God so very far away from the way we should treat one another. She looked back on that place, became a pillar of salt and was useless. We don't want to look back. We can't afford to sit 
and use just words to convince people about Christ. We actually have to use actions and words. Words backed by actions, actions working with words, teaching about the real life of Jesus Christ to our community. It comes through a pure tongue, a generous spirit, and sometimes even a generous wallet. And we need to work alongside our community. In our working, we must show the reality of a life impacted by Jesus Christ. We're a people who trust God to bring about his best, whatever that looks like. So when God opens an opportunity to speak, we speak the pure gospel. Jesus is God. Jesus came in human form. He came that we might believe in him. Because he came to die for our sin. Period. That was a reason he came. And then he rose again. And he ascended to the Father. And for those who believe in him, they too shall ascend to the Father. When Jesus comes again, we will all be together in heaven. Any who believe in him shall be saved. You know, we can't water that down. We can't dilute that. We can't hide that under a basket, under a bushel. We have to be willing to say, this is why I do what I do, because I love my Lord. You see, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the way the glory of the gospel is, is when the church is absolutely different from the rest of the world. That's when the community, that's when the world will see Christ, is when they see something different in here. And that's when they're attracted. So if we want to be attractable, if that's even a word, we need to allow the glory of God to shine. So how do we win the world to Christ? Unworldly and Christ-like. Let's pray. Listen, if you're watching online, if you're sitting here and you've never received Christ Jesus as Lord, you've never said to him, wow, I need you, Lord Jesus. And I desire to have that relationship that shows me that I can go to heaven with you. Then just join me in prayer. Everything that has separated me from God, thank you. I want to live for you today. Would you show me how to do that? Would you help me to understand the reality of being salt of the earth and light of the world? Today is a new day. For those of us who already know Christ and have been walking with him a while, I just want to I just want to challenge you and say, you know, what are we doing? Lord Jesus, help us to do the works that you did when you walked this earth. Everywhere you went, you shone your light. Everywhere you went, you salted the earth with the truth. Everywhere you went, you brought people into the kingdom of God. And that is exactly what you've asked us to do.